to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would direct our hearts, focus our minds, open our ears, so that we can receive your truth, Lord, through this passage. So that we can see even more clearly the free gift of righteousness that is given by your grace through Jesus Christ to all who receive it. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, if you go through the book of Romans, you get to deal with some of the big topics, the big questions of uh, the Christian faith and really of any religious system, any worldview. And one major question that every worldview needs to answer is this. What is our natural state as human beings? What condition are we in? Or another way to put it is, why do people do bad things? Or, why is sin universal? And why is death universal? That is, any religious system, any worldview, has to answer the question of the universality of sin and the universality of death. I mean, people don't live forever. Now, a, a naturalist or, or a secular person might say, well, we just haven't evolved enough to, to get to the point where people can live forever. Oh, we'll still be waiting, I think, for that for a long time. <laughs> but really, there are only two views, you see, of humanity. There's the naturalistic view that human beings are basically good or, at worst, morally neutral. That's one view, and popularized over a number of years, but in the last uh, century or so through uh, behavioristic uh, kind of thinking that human beings are simply a, a, a product of their conditioning. And so uh, in order to change, you just have to be conditioned to the right, the right things. Or there's the biblical view. Human beings are fallen beyond any human hope, have a sin nature, and they need saving. There's really only those two views. Now, you could say, well, human beings are, are a mixture of, of good and evil. But, but even, even then, you have to face the universality of sin and the universality of death. And so, again, there's those two basic worldviews. That human beings are essentially good. At worst, they would be morally neutral. You know, the whole idea of, of a person being a blank slate and that their life is simply a product of what their experiences and what they've been conditioned to. Or the biblical view that human beings are in quite a predicament. Amen? That human beings are fallen and in a state of sin without Christ and they need saving. And so we looked at Genesis chapter 3 last time and we went through some of the aspects of the fall of humanity. Adam and Eve sinned and there, was, there, were, there were consequences to that sin. There was their own uh, shame, their own guilt, their own fear their own hiding from God, and then the, the curse uh, came, uh, and the serpent is cursed, and the woman's uh, pain in childbirth is increased, and, and God says, cursed will be the ground that you will work, Adam, and with pain and toil, you, it will produce food for you. And so there was a separation from God where they were, they were uh, driven out of the garden, and then there was certain death as well, physical death and spiritual death. And so Romans 5, verses 12 through 21, gives a clearer picture of humanity in a state of sin. And as we have that clear picture of humanity in a state of sin, because we are all in Adam, we see the joyous and abundant grace of God given to us in Jesus Christ. See, only if we see what the, the depth of the problem is do we see the goodness of what Jesus Christ brings. Amen? That is, in bringing salvation and new life, Jesus Christ undoes, restores, conquers, and reigns over what happened to humanity in Adam. That doesn't mean that Jesus gives us a perfect life when we, come, we become believers and, and, and everything's good from there on. No, he undoes what happened to us in Adam so that we have that new life 
And as we are sanctified, as we grow in our faith in Christ, he is preparing us to be glorified with him and for him to reign. The, the theoretical question, I guess, is in some sense, well, if Adam didn't, hadn't sinned, would he have lived forever? Well, I guess theoretically he would have lived forever because the scripture made clear that, that sin comes in and then death comes as a result of sin. But Adam wouldn't, still wouldn't have had a glorified, uh, glorified body. And so when, what Jesus comes to do is to save us, to undo, restore, conquer, and reign over all that happened to humanity in Adam. Now, if I were to say that and, and we were to personalize it a little bit, let me put it this way. For each of us, the most corrupt part of my own soul, the most devastating of my own choices, the ugliest of my own thoughts, God's grace not only covers, but the scripture says in verse 20 and 21, grace superabounds. Where sin increased, grace increased all the more. That word there is, it has the prefix hyper. Hyperabounding. That the ugliest part of my own thoughts, the most devastating of my own choices, the most corrupt part of my own soul, God's grace not only covers, but his grace superabounds. Amen? Amen? Now we won't go into it this week, but, but scripture talks about how we have a sinful nature, and when we are born again, God gives us a new nature. And there's verses in the New Testament that talk about the the new nature. Walk in accordance with your new nature. Now, one question that comes up as you look at this passage is, well, you know, what's all this about being in Adam? Isn't that just kind of an allegory or a mythical, mythical figure? That's a common objection. But I think it's fairly clear, if you just read Romans 5 uh, in this passage, that Paul is referring to Adam as the first actual human being. And he's referring to historical events, not, not myths. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, it's on the screen, so maybe if you just want to make note of it. Uh, Paul is talking about how our we will have glorified bodies in eternity. And he says, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a life-living being. The last Adam, referring to Christ, became a life-giving spirit. So you have the first Adam and the last Adam, and then 1 Corinthians 15, 49. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Now again, you're talking about the Apostle Paul who saw the resurrected Christ. And so he's not just talking about spiritual concepts. He's not just talking about uh, allegory or myth. He's talking about actual people, Adam and Jesus. And he's making that, making that reference. Uh, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 19, says this. They ask him a question about divorce. And he says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So Jesus refers to them as human beings. The first human beings, not just myth, not just allegory. And yes, God wants a man to leave his father and mother and, and hold fast to his wife. <laughs> so you see that it's not, it's not just referring to something spiritual or something uh, that's, that's mythical or allegorical. It's referring to uh, real human beings. Now, the text communicates, in Romans 5, the text communicates more than just the little Adam, but it certainly communicates no less than a literal Adam. Amen? It communicates more than that because Adam is our representative, but it certainly communicates no less than a literal Adam. And, uh, I, and I like some of these uh, jokes about uh, Adam. Here's Adam's job interview, his predicament with his job interview. So, Adam, your resume claims that you have no work history because work didn't exist, never used to exist. And what is the deal with animal naming experience? <laughs> Actually, work did exist before the fall. It's just that work became harder and more toilsome after the fall into sin.
but, uh, but I, I get a kick out of those sometimes. So what is our, our predicament being in Adam? Look at verse 12 again, chapter 5. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. What is our predicament? We are in sin, and death is the result of sin. Not only physical deaths, but spiritual death. And then in verse 19, it says, For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. So what is our predicament? Well, this goes to what is called the concept of original sin. And that's referring to the condition, this is a summary of it, but this is essentially the concept, the condition of sinfulness that all persons share caused by the sin of Adam and Eve and the resulting fall. That we all inherit a sin nature, that we all are counted guilty in Adam. Why? Because in verse 12 it says, death spread to all men because all sinned. The implication is all sinned in Adam. Now, then the question is, well, that seems a little bit unfair because how does God count us guilty for a sin that we did not actually commit? So that's a common, common objection. The text doesn't exactly tell us how that sin was transmitted. There's been different views over time in terms of the realist view. Well, if, if Adam and Eve were the fierce human beings, then literally we all were there in Adam. Not acting independently, according to our own consciousness, but we were all there. That's called the realist view. But also, we were there because Adam is our representative. We all have a sin nature. Every person is born with a sin nature, and therefore sin corrupts every aspect of our lives in some way. Maybe you can identify with this. A parent writes, my daughter is 33 months old and I have a few concerns about her social behavior. She seems to have a lot of issues playing with other children her age. I think it's more of a possessive thing, but she refuses to share her toys with other children who come over for play dates at our house. She will rip toys out of any other kid's hands and become very aggressive and has even hit other kids before they take her toys, even when they have asked permission. It is to the point now where if I take her to the local playground, she will get agitated if another child comes to play in the same area as her. She will even not allow myself or my husband to play with her toys and will tell us no and take the toy away from us. I feel like a broken record because I am constantly trying to address the concept of sharing with her, but she is not seeming to get it. So you need to teach a child how to share, how to be generous, how to consider others, but you don't need to teach a child how to say no, or how to lie, or how to take something that's not theirs. And so the, the uh, advisor on this, answering this question says, well, haven't you heard of the toddler's creed? This is known as the toddler's creed. Maybe you've heard this before. If I want it, it's mine. If I give it to you and I change my mind later, it's also mine. If I can take it away from you, it's mine. If I had it a little while ago, it's also mine. It's mine and it will never belong to anybody else no matter what. If we are building something together, all the pieces are mine. If it looks just like mine, it's mine. That's the toddler creed. Now, what I really get a kick out of is when you read some of these uh, per parent, parental help websites and it says something like this. During the second stage of child development, the ages of two and seven, children are likely to show signs of egocentric behavior. A child does not understand cognitively at that point that someone else's opinions can be different from his or her perceptions. This, is, this type of thinking is called egocentric. Egocentrism is when one thinks about himself and only cares about his own need, desire, and view. An egocentric child's vocabulary will be dominated with the expressions of no, me, mine, and mine. This type of behavior is vastly found in children, but can also be observed in adults. How about that? Wow, that's, that's a revelation. E 
egocentric children have a tendency to be self-centered, self-serving, and self-focused. Every human being on the planet has a tendency to be self-centered, self-serving, and self-focused. That's what the scripture teach, scriptures teach, and that's what our experience is. We are all in Adam in our sin. And that sin affects every aspect of our lives. So a couple of objections to that is one might say, well, isn't it unfair if God counts us as guilty for a sin that we did not actually commit? Well, yes, it may seem that way, but it's equally even more gracious for God to count us righteous for something that we didn't do, that we are unable to achieve. That's one answer. Another objection might be, well, how can this be fair if some people have limited mental capacities or are not even aware of God's commandments? And that's a, that's a fair objection that we have to look to other scriptures to, to uh, see what the scriptures say about that. Another objection might be, well, wasn't Adam himself in a state of neutrality with the ability to choose good or evil? Aren't we in the same state now? Don't human beings will have that ability? Don't we, don't we have that self-determination? Well, I'm glad you asked. A little church history lesson. There was a teacher named Pelagius in the early church, and he was a contemporary of St. Augustine. And Pelagius argued against original sin. And his point was essentially this, that humanity is neutral, morally neutral, and has the power to choose between good and evil, Therefore, man is essentially able to restore himself to God. That was the Pelagian view. He basically didn't, didn't agree with the idea of original sin. Now, fast forward, uh, what, uh, 1,500 years. Shaler Matthews, a modernist theologian, died right uh, during World War II. He says, the loving God of the universe will save a man who tries to live like Jesus. Sounds a lot like the same thing. See, if grace is grace, truly a free gift of righteousness, then our efforts do not count towards our salvation. Now, good deeds, uh, the scripture says, be zealous for good works because they, they are the fruit of salvation. They are the, a byproduct of someone who's saved. But original sin teaches that we are all in Adam. And that the image of God in us has been corrupted and can only be renewed by Jesus Christ. So think about this. What is our predicament? A few other concepts here. What are more consequences of being in Adam? Well, intellectually, if you're in Adam and not in Christ, you're unreceptive to spiritual truth. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians, this, the, the natural man does not accept the things of God because he does not have the spirit. Volitionally, if we're in Adam and not in Christ, we're repeatedly choosing sin. Emotionally, if we're in Adam and not in Christ, we're, we're prone to blaming, prone to jealousy, prone to envy. Relationally, if we're in Adam, we're alienated from God and others. Physically, there's decay and death. So death spread to all men because all sin. Bruce Demarest, a theologian and author, wrote it this way. He says, This grim human condition, widely attested by the Bible and life experience, this grim condition constitutes the stage for the display of God's marvelous grace. Amen? That constitutes the stage for God's display of his marvelous grace. Now, the question then is, what, what Paul has a little aside here, and he says, well, what's the point of the law? What's the point of the law? In verse 13 and 14, sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So you have Adam and Eve, Genesis 3, uh, they, they sin and rebel against God, and then you have this time frame between them and Moses where the law was given, the Mosaic law was given, the Ten Commandments, 
And you have that time gap in between. And Paul's saying, well, what's the point of the law? And then in verse 20, you have the same question. Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So between the time of Adam and Eve and Moses, people were still sinning, but they didn't have the positive commandments. They didn't have the specific commandments like the Israelites did after the time of Moses. And so what's Paul's point? His point is death still reigned. Death still reigned, even though they weren't sinning in the same way that Adam was, where they were given a specific command, death still reigned. Sin was still all-pervasive and mortal in its effect, says F.F. Bruce, about that time period. Now, the law then came in to increase the trespass. The law came in to reveal sin for what it is. And so we look at Galatians chapter 3. You have the same question. What's, what's the purpose of the law then? Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. See, the law was given so that people could see sin for what it is. It was also given as a, as a common grace to restrain evil. But the law was given so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So the opposite of what was destined for all human beings because of Adam is now offered as a gift to be received by faith. Amen? The opposite of what what became of humanity in Adam is now offered as a gift, that righteousness to be received. So the similarity is the act of one person is counted on behalf of many. That's the similarity between Adam and Christ. Christ uh, is referred to uh, in 1 Corinthians as the last Adam. So the similarity is that the actions of one are counted to the many. But the difference is that what Adam could never redeem, Christ has done willingly. That's why we rejoice. Verse 15, the free gift is not like the trespass. So how does Jesus Christ bring righteousness to us? Through his perfectly obedient, sacrificial death on our behalf. What was the other problem with Pelagius denying original sin? Well, that conveniently makes the atonement unnecessary. Why? Because if a man has the ability to follow God's commands by himself and restore himself to God, then there's no point in Christ's death. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification in life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Grace is freely given as a gift, not as an inevitable consequence, not as simply a knee-jerk reaction to humanity's sin. Adam brought condemnation. Christ brings justification. And the scripture says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you have self-condemning thoughts, you can go to that passage, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, and say, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We can rest in that. And grace is not simply God the Father tolerating you. Grace is more than just God tolerating you. Grace is God welcoming you. God welcoming you and saying, Come, come to me. You have access. You have relationship. We are declared righteous. So he welcomes us. You and I have an abundance of grace. What does an abundance mean? It means a surplus. It means a supply that does not run out. It's enough to cover any need, an expected need or an unexpected need. And grace superabounds, it says, in verse 20, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, or grace superabounded. 
So what does that look like in our lives? That's the question, because you may, you may be thinking, well, Pastor, I certainly agree with, with what you're saying up to this point, but how does that really work? Well, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> what does grace abounding and superabounding look like? Through Christ, notice the text says, we reign in life because grace abounds. Christ strengthens us to reign over sin by grace. By grace. And through Christ, we reign in life because grace abounds. That is, sin no longer reigns or rules over us because we are in Christ. Forgiveness is just the beginning, and then Christ strengthens us to reign over sin by grace. The book of Titus says this, and it's always fascinating to me the way, it, the way it's phrased. book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Grace trains us for godliness. The fact that Jesus has redeemed us from all lawlessness and is purifying us for himself, a people for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. What are you zealous about today? What have you been zealous about this last year with all of the COVID uh, restrictions and all of the changes in life? I, t I was talking to a good friend this week and who lives in another state, and he said, he said, you know, I've realized that I've complained more in this past calendar year than I ever have in my entire life. He wasn't saying that because he was proud of it. He was saying that because he was just confessing, repenting. Lord, I complain a lot. So grace trains us to renounce ungodliness and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. And create a people who are zealous for good works. When grace rules in our lives, when grace reigns, God makes us zealous for good works. Secondly, what does grace superabounding look like? It means that Christ, uh, look, if we can go back to that slide, thanks. Christ can heal us from damaged emotions, broken relationships, and ruined character, which have resulted from our sin or someone else's sin. If grace abounds, then there is enough grace for God to do that. Now, we have to yield to that. We have to, we have to be acknowledging our own sin and how we've contributed to problems and how we've contributed to broken relationships or, or, or hurt other people. But sometimes there's an emotional hurt. There's an emotional damage. And you look at how Jesus dealt with people. And people who were hurting and people who were in need. He didn't, he didn't you know, rub salt in the wound, so to speak. Is Jesus' grace enough to heal us from damaged emotions, damaged relationships, and damaged character? If we believe that it is, then we need to trust that he can do that. There's a book um, uh, by a man named David Siemens called Healing Damaged Emotions. Healing Damaged Emotions. And he says, he says basically, I, 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 I talk to people in church all the time about Christ's forgiveness, and we all nod our heads and say, Christ's forgiveness is enough for me. But yet we have all of these unresolved, damaged emotions. And he says, sometimes it just takes a special work of the Holy Spirit to, to heal those things. But we believe that Christ is enough, amen? Yes. And so Jesus says, you have not because you ask not. You know, knock, seek, ask. There's an article... Uh, that someone shared with me a couple of weeks ago, and the title of it threw me the first time when he shared it, but 
He said, why don't you read this article? Uh, it's called, I'll Never Get Over It. I'll Never Get Over It. And then the subtitle is Help for the Aggrieved. Help for the Aggrieved. It's by David Pallison, who's a, uh, he's now with the Lord, but he's a Christian counselor and author for many years. And he says, he says, basically, you have a choice when difficult things happen, either as a result of your sin or someone else's sin. It says it's, it's either going to make you more wise or it's going to make you more bitter. He says, this is a life and death matter. When something is so wrong that you will never get over it, your reaction will either make you wise or it will poison you. Great suffering puts a fork in the road. You will choose. You will of necessity choose. It is no accident that Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, is the essential prayer of the man or woman who faces facts honestly. It is no accident that blessed are the poor in spirit is the first and foundational beatitude. A deep inner sense of need for help from outside of yourself is the essential step of sanity. It is this faith that I am poor and needy, help me. It is this faith that Jesus commends so often. Faith is not a leap into darkness and unreason, despite the cold, hard facts. Faith is the honest reckoning with your need for help, and then the reasonable step in the direction of the person who can help you, given all the facts. And only God knows all the facts. He says, when hopes are crushed and dismembered, you must learn the one hope that can never be destroyed. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Those words are not just intended for religious people in religious contexts. Those are words for the actual troubles we all must face, for the actual failings we all have, and for all the things that prompt the son's self-sacrificing love. And he says, when this gets a hold of you, and this takes root inside of you, you learn how to live well up against all that is wrong. Beloved, if God loved us in this way, we also ought to love one another. 1 John 4, 11. He says you can be thankful. You can consider others. You can do small things gladly. You can learn that you can make some difference. The grace of God is enough to transform us. Thirdly, Christ will transform us to live more honestly and more vulnerably. Christ will transform us to live more vulnerably and more honestly. That's, what I think, part of what grace abounding means. What was the result of Adam and Eve after they sinned? They hid from God. It says they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Why? Because they were hiding from God. They were ashamed. They were hiding from each other. And then Genesis chapter 3, verse 21 says, God made garments of skin for them. So whatever way you have been hiding from God, whatever way you may be hiding from others, whatever way you are afraid to be yourself and open yourself up to other people, God in his grace will strengthen you to live more openly. This quote is from uh, Francis Bacon. Those who lack friends to open themselves unto, or up to, are cannibals of their own hearts. This communicating of a man's self to his friends works two contrary effects. He says, for it redoubles joy, and it cuts grief in half. Do we have people in our lives who we are willing to live vulnerably before and open before? When God's grace is abounding, he enables you to do that because you're not self-protecting anymore. You're not, you're, not, you're not thinking, well, what about my insecurities? Or what about if I share this and, and I might be rejected? Or this might, person might think my concerns are trivial. You're not doing that because you're, you're remembering the grace of Jesus. Love covers a multitude of sin. Now, you have to be careful who you open up to for certain. You choose those friends carefully. But if you don't have anyone in your life like that, the chances that you live honestly and openly and vulnerably with others are, are not very high. God
God in his grace will strengthen us to live more openly. And I, I address this uh, mainly to the, to the men. Uh, this is a helpful diagram that I've seen before. I may have shared it with you, but um, there's a, a counselor on the West Coast. His name is Chuck DeGroat, and he, he uh, has adapted this diagram from some other writings that he's, uh, he's uh, familiar with. But he says, he says, this is typical of a man's spiritual journey to maturity. And he says, in the first phase, and I'm going to have to get close to this to read it, the subtitles. But he says, the first phase is the heroic phase. When we're young, we think we can conquer the world. And he says the heroic journey is a stage of idealism, a time of ego development, duty, responsibility, hard work, black and white worldview, immaturity, potentially dangerous, even though it is earnest and generous. Okay? Doesn't that describe a lot of us in our younger years? So there's a sense of idealism. Then comes the identity crisis. Then comes the midlife crisis where your responsibilities are a lot higher than your capabilities. And you go, uh-oh. And he says, there's a couple ways you can go. You can continue on that upward trajectory. So the crisis is a time of necessary despair, a focus, an inner loss of meaning, or a confusion of what's right and what's not right. Attempts to regain control. Idealism doesn't work anymore. Failures become more evident. Honesty and humility are necessary. God begins to take control. So then the question is, which way are you going to go? And I've identified the three, uh, three paths. If, if someone continues on that idealistic trajectory uh, without, <laughs> without realism, they're, they're shallow. The shallow man or woman doesn't get it despite failures and limitations, still attempting to live in black and white and control. We, we, know, we know folks that end up like that, that they, they continue on that journey and they think, oh yeah, this is, this is great, I can conquer the world. These are the ideals. And, and you go, wait a second, here's reality. <laughs> What's the other option? Apathetic or ambivalent. And he says, an ambivalent journey, negative, cynical, still looking for someone to blame, wounds not yet sacred. That's an interesting phrase, his wounds are not yet sacred. And so we all have this identity crisis, and we have these hurts. So what do we do with them? We, if, if we resolve them with the Lord, then we become wise. And he calls the, the last step is the, the, the path of wisdom. The holy fool, a beloved son or daughter, a mellow soul. <laughs> it's an interesting phrase. Embraces paradox with joy, trusts the heart. Weakness has become strength. And he talks about that. Wisdom journey, letting go, trusting, surrendering, and compassion, the dark night of the soul, secure enough to be insecure, redefining of victory and success, embracing the sufferings of Christ, and the inner self matches the outer self. The inner self matches the outer self. Don't we, don't we desire that in the way we live? And so God transforms us when grace superabounds. He will transform us so that we can live more vulnerably and more honestly. Lastly, how does grace superabound? Grace superabounds when the Spirit is at work in us producing fruit which we can never produce while being in Adam. A couple of scriptures here. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. How can we live in Christ in a way that we could not live in Adam? Because the Holy Spirit is in us and producing that fruit. And the question is, are we seeking that fruit? I heard this week somebody uh, on a radio show, they said, they said, are you working on your resume values or your funeral values? Are you working on your resume values, the things that are going to build you up in this world? Or are you working on your funeral values, the things that people will remember about you after you're gone? I thought that was pretty convicting. Let's go back to the main point again. In bringing salvation and new life, Jesus Christ undoes, restores, conquers, and reigns over what has happened to humanity in Adam. And he, he 
He brings about that fruit. When grace is abounding and superabounding, he brings about that fruit. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. That's the last slide. What does grace superabounding and abounding look like? It looks like assuming the best and believing the best about other brothers and sisters because they are in Christ. Leading with grace. Leading with grace. Ephesians chapter 4, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Are we eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? Are we eager when we come together for a congregational meeting this evening? Are we eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace? I hope that we are. And the only way we can do that is by grace superabounding, by believing the best and assuming the best motives about other brothers and sisters. Why? Because they are in Christ and leading with grace. When grace is abounding and superabounding, that happens. And we recognize the Spirit's work. Let's pray. Father, we pray that these things would be true of us as the church, as families, as individuals, as a community of believers that we would be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, that we would bear with one another in love, that we would be forgiving of one another, uh, that we would be quick to recognize our own sin and our own prejudgments and our own uh, complaints and, and grumbling and all those sorts of things. Lord, the only way that we can do this is if your grace abounds. And we thank you. We thank you that we can now receive your grace, the free gift of righteousness. That we are not destined to death, which is a result of Adam's sin and our own sin. But those who believe and trust are given the free gift of righteousness. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts today. And I just ask right now that if, if there are any here who simply want to affirm that in their own hearts, Lord, you know who they are. You know the hearts of each one of us. Nothing is hidden from your eyes. And so we pray, thanking you for your grace that abounds. We ask this in Jesus' name. I would ask the worship.